One day you'll tell the story of autocrats, crooks, and kings who came for our freedom. A story of citizens who stood up to tyranny and won. The people prevailed and renewed an old vow to a more perfect union. And that was just the beginning. The story continues. Narrative. Where truth lives. Welcome to Narrative Live. It's good to be with you and Eric Garland. How are you, Eric? Good to see you. I'm great, Ev. The day just flies by when there's so much news and there is tons of it. We're going to talk a lot about what's in the news, but also our special report, which is part of the Dragon's Tale, which is going to be about who really funds this Christian nationalist movement that has been spawned from the QAnon movement that had all those people with a one-fingered salute at Donald Trump earlier on this week or last week. We'll get into all of that and we'll figure out exactly who's funding this movement and it'll keep you shocked and surprised although there's a little hint in the dragon's tail as to where we land up in the investigation but let's start off by talking about that tish james we expected this fraud case to come down against the trump organization and against the trump children one thing to expect that kind of court case to be landing it's another thing completely to actually hear the details and for it to be written down in, in paper the way it was let's talk a little bit about what do you think about that it's a civil case because I think the criminal jurisdiction is going to be federal. Wire fraud, bank fraud is probably, there could be an element of RICO here, the Racketeer Influence Corrupt Organizations Act, because you've got multi layers and there's probably some money laundering that's gone on, but she led strong. If you have different valuations for your properties for different people, you don't got to be a veteran prosecutor. No, that sounds illegal. Well, it is. That's bank fraud and that's 10 to 15 years in New York state and it's 20 years and at the federal level. They didn't so, just do it once or twice. They did it repeatedly on every property and they overvalued their property by multiples, not just a little bit. They weren't just overstating it by $10,000 or here or there. They were overstating it by a multiple of nine times, which is- yeah. You're not fibbing a little bit. You're talking about major tax evasion at that yeah. point. We've covered the story for a long time. The one that's really fascinating right now is also this Mar-a-Lago investigation. That was a pretty swift shutdown by the uh, appeals court in the 11th circuit there because yeah, they really uh, disagreed <laughs> on, a, on, a, on a basic premise there that he could call all these things declassified or personal or whatever he decided to call them. Trump is in for a rude awakening. I mean, we've been saying it for a few weeks now that the mood in DC is they've had it. They are going after him and they are indeed going after him. There are very few options left for Donald Trump to get out of the Mar-a-Lago espionage case investigation. And certainly it looks like Tish James is already in there and there's more to come. Now on the Mar-a-Lago investigation, it is interesting that what has been held quite secretly and privately by some people is beginning to show up in a bunch of places that one of the things that was leaked were confidential informant IDs oh, and that, also that's, that's spy bad. IDs. And basically he compromised a large chunk of the law and order infrastructure of our country by compromising the people who are spies by compromising people who are confidential informants just by having those names out there he's compromised the national security of the country oh yeah and that is at the core i think of what is coming out of these documents we know that he's a crooked guy that's not news what is news would be what he did with these documents did he sell them to a foreign country did he give them to Mohammed bin Salman, did he give them to Putin? Did he give them to Xi? Who would have valued these things to such an extent that he would knowingly, obviously, break the law to give it to them? And how much is it worth? And what, what value does it have out there for them? Because that's really where you the know, value comes from. And the value comes from knowing who the confidential informants are, knowing who the, who the spies are in your country. That's where they'd be value. I think this comes back to a fundamental point that I've had for about six straight years here, which is you just shouldn't have spies and traitors in the White House. You shouldn't have that. You just shouldn't have it. Um, <laughs> let's move on to some other news because we no longer have a spy or a traitor in the White House. But he met the new prime minister of Britain today. This, oh, this Biden trust. did. Yes, the non-spy in the White House. It didn't go so well, apparently, according to 
uh, Ms. Truss, who said she was a bit demeaned by the whole meeting. I'm not sure what she meant by that, but it also, um, the White House is saying it might be uh, considering a special relationship, not so much anymore, now that Liz Truss is around. Now, what could this be about? So there's plenty of speculation. I don't know, but you had an interesting point about what Truss is doing in Israel. According to Haaretz today, the UK could move its embassy to Jerusalem. Now, the last group of people that were messing around with that were like the Trump people. And also in the news today, uh, Yair Lapid renewed his commitment to a two-state solution. Of course, that moving your embassy out of Tel Aviv to this holy city that is shared by all these different religions, of course, is very uh, provocative. Hmm. So it's odd that uh, this Liz Trust, she's committed to this thing that the prime minister of Israel probably isn't that happy about. Yeah, so it's pretty interesting that they're doing something that is unilateral there and also reminiscent of Trump. She's a pretty right-wing lady, but you don't want to rupture the relationship with the United States. You certainly want to hold on to that special relationship. That's when leaders are out of step with the United States, but some of them go out of step and then maybe they come back. Mohammed bin Salman is apparently staging a diplomatic comeback. He was the guy negotiating the release of the Russians and the Ukrainian soldiers. And there were a few Americans in there and a few Brits in there that were passed around you back and forth so we could get some sort of prisoner exchange going on. It's fascinating that he is trying to rehabilitate himself on the world stage. He's the guy who cuts up the journalists. I have yeah. him correct. Okay. The guy who cuts up the journalists who had a bit of an interesting visit from Mr. Biden a few weeks ago. And I still don't know what happened to that meeting. But it seems to me that everything changed at that meeting. Suddenly the oil prices started plummeting. Suddenly he started helping Zelensky out with prisoner exchanges and a whole bunch of things. So it might be interesting to know what uh, pressure points Biden might've found, because that seems like it's plausible. In fact, Zelensky went out of his way to point out today that he not only had a cordial conversation with the crown prince, but he also discussed energy security, post-war recovery and joint investment projects. Now, if you remember MBS high-fiving Vladimir Putin a few years ago, at the G20, like they were the best oh, yeah. of friends, that is not consistent with what we're seeing now <laughs> diplomatically around the world. It looks to me like that, uh, that alliance, the coalition, which brought us Donald Trump is having some trouble staying together. And I think that's all due to the very, very brilliant foreign policy of President Biden. At MBS has a lot of redemption to be doing around the world and he seems to be doing it. And if he continues to redeem himself in this way, that's good news, I think for everybody. This dude, not likable at all, the Hungarian Prime Minister Viktor Orban, he is the only person in the world that is standing up and saying that because Vladimir Putin is threatening nuclear war and because he's calling up another million, as many as one million reservists to the fight in Ukraine, he still thinks that President Putin's sanctions and sanctions against Russia should be lifted by the end of this year, which tells you exactly which camp he's in. Now, we of course know that Mr. Orban is the spiritual godfather of the MAGA movement, really, this is the GOP. Yeah, speaking. he's showed up at CPAC and they yeah. sent CPAC yeah. over to him and... Yeah, and here they are yeah. basically saying, hey, Putin's a great guy, let's keep the war going. So this is like a GOP, this isn't a GOP ally, this is like a GOP supporter, this is a big guy around the world who really believes in what the GOP is doing. Does it mean the GOP supporting Putin's nuclear threats against the West? Does it mean that the GOP is actually in support of the million new soldiers that are going to be poured into Ukraine by Russia, if that's in fact what they do? That seems to me like a not good policy for the Republican Party a few weeks ahead of the elections. I think they're back on the wrong horse there. That's me. But yeah. <laughs> I think i am been pretty forward on how I feel they're about that. They're back on the wrong horse. But if their spiritual godfather thinks that sanctions should be lifted, and they're not saying that here, in, and they certainly should be denouncing Mr. Orban, and I don't think they have done that publicly. Politics are supposed to end at the shore. That's one of the old sayings. And these guys have broken that. They broke it and they brought him to the headline, the CPAC conference, uh, by all accounts, is basically mentoring Trump in how to speak and how, on what talking points to use. And as we'll see in the next half hour, there's a lot of white nationalism, Christian supremacy, whatever you want to call it going on in the MAGA movement right now. And it seems that Mr. Orban is part of that, but then he's on Putin's side in the war in Ukraine. Last night, or two nights ago, we were going to talk about the Christian nationalist movement, its origins, and how it was found. We ran out of time to go through all the details on that, and we are going to do that tonight. Some of this might be a little repetitive of what happened last week, but it's much better because we've had additional research added to it that is going to blow your mind. I think we're going to take you through a journey into the world of 
white and Christian nationalism that you can't really believe. Who's backing it, who's supporting it, the fake fronts that they're putting up to pretend that there are certain things when they're not, all of that is going to be revealed in the next half hour. And because it's so amazingly interesting, it does take us back to the theme of the year on the narrative, which is the dragon's tail, which is China's attack on US democracy and China's war on the US democracy. Every minute of narratives reporting, every story that we break is made possible by our patrons. You too can become a patron by joining at patreon.com forward slash narrative. Narrative, where truth lives.